Thank you for joining our live stream. We will begin shortly. Time has snuck up on us. It is time for us to begin our Bible study tonight. I want to welcome you to our study. So thankful that you're here and that we have the ability to study together. I'm very excited about our study tonight. As uh, we've made mention in previous class, how the minor prophets uh, often seem to be uh, an overlooked part of God's word, and yet right here in the middle of the minor prophets, we have one of the best known stories in all of God's word uh, that even many many. Uh, people that wouldn't consider themselves particularly religious uh, are, are familiar with and and stories a story that is often taught to very young children so uh, it's, a, it's a good opportunity tonight to review this and and really focus in on some of the messages and things that we're going to uh, be able to learn from our study uh, if you are visiting with us by chance and and didn't uh, pick up a workbook there are some available right there in the foyer just as you step si step outside these doors feel free to stand up and get one or just raise your hand and i'll make sure somebody picks the one up for you um, if you have not yet volunteered to uh, get a pre-assigned passage to read or question to answer and you want to do that just let me know or if you've previously told me and I haven't called on you yet let me know that too it, <laughs> you may have told me and I somehow forgot to write it down so I, I'd enjoy uh, putting you down I've got quite a few who've who volunteered for that I really appreciate that and uh, tonight's no different so we'll be engaging our study tonight and appreciate everyone's participation if if you didn't get a pre-assigned uh, passage or, or question uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't speak up if you have a question or a comment feel free to do so tonight as we have time let's begin tonight with a word of prayer and then we'll jump right into our study our most righteous father you have blessed us so greatly again today we love you and thank you for your for your kindness and care for your compassion we're thankful for the opportunity we have tonight to be reminded of that compassion as we study through the book of Jonah. Help us tonight to focus our minds on this study and to take home those thoughts and, and uh, ideas that we ought to be incorporating into our lives. Help us, Father, to become more perfect and complete. Thank you for the example of Jesus, and thank you especially for his death and sacrifice that is the ultimate manifestation of your mercy in your love for mankind. We pray for your forgiveness as we repent of our sins, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay, so I forgot to get the clicker. Let me grab that. <coughs> I may need some help. I don't, is it back there? Okay. Thanks so much. So as we're studying through the Minor Prophets, uh, what are some things that come to mind with regard to some of the messages that the prophets have emphasized? What have we noticed in our studies? Real quick, anybody? Okay, a need for repentance. And, and the reason for that, and, you know, we've seen emphasized on over, over and over again, is the fact that when men cho chose sin, they really were chosen. Cho choosing a different path they were departing from the way of God and so the prophets emphasized that and as a result of that sin what ultimately would come judgment so there's many warnings about judgment and then off well we haven't seen an exception to this okay where uh, not only do the prophets talk about God's judgment but ultimately God's what upon those who would obey mercy his desire for men to repent as, as Jimmy said and then ultimately uh, his willingness to extend mercy and really the emphasis on that is that there's not much a sinner can do to, to rectify a situation is there really nothing a sinner can do to rectify a situation in the sense that God's mercy is the basis for that forgiveness it's not that we can put God in position of owing us something but that we uh, God extends that towards us Stephen God is sending these prophets to warn them over and over yeah. shows the long suffering nature yeah. of God. Yeah. Wants them to Absolutely. Want to That's right. Thank you for bringing that up. That's an excellent point that these prophets, just the fact that they exist, that, that they existed and were put to this task, demonstrates God's love for really all men. And we're going to see that clearly tonight as we study through Jonah. So, just real quickly, what was Hosea about? Just a quick thought or idea that comes to your mind when you think about Hosea. Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. Idolatry and redemption, which was pictured really through Hosea's relationship with his wife, right? How she was a, an adulterous woman. God instructed Hosea to marry her and ultimately to redeem her from her harlotry. And that was a picture of, of Israel's uh, harlotry against God as they engaged in idolatry and God's willingness to continue to show love uh, towards them. What about Joel? What are some thoughts or ideas that come to your mind when you hear Joel? Locust. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this the swarm of locusts, and then what else was going to come? An invasion, right? A terrible invasion. And, and over and over, the term day of the Lord, okay? So when I think of Joel, I think day of the Lord. Not that Joel's the only one that uses that term. We've seen that term uh, in some of the other prophets we've studied so far, but day of the Lord, Joel really uh, focuses on that. And that day of the Lord is a, great, a day of great distress as the, that indicated by the locusts and the invasion, uh, but it also was a day of blessings for those who would choose to follow God. And so the day of the Lord is is really focusing on God's control. God is the one who who governs all these these matters. Uh, what about Amos? What comes to your mind when you think about Amos? Oh, I love that transgression transgression you know we pointed out right there at the beginning of Amos the first couple of chapters God is pointing out the transgressions of not just Israel and not just Judah but of of those two nations plus six Gentile nations which points out a very important point we're going to see again tonight God is concerned and always has been about the obedience of all men it wasn't just the nation of Israel that he was concerned about even in the Old Testament, right? It was throughout time, God has been concerned about the obedience of all men, and Amos points out their transgression, pronounces God's judgment, and, and then offers hope. Um, and a Amos prophesied roughly at the same time as Hosea, uh, primarily to the northern kingdom, even though we, we've noticed that he prophesied to these other nations as well. Hosea it was also prophesying to the northern kingdom in approximately the same time period. Joel was prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah, probably 80 or 100 years prior to the time of, of Hosea and Amos. And then what about Obadiah? What's his message or who is he prophesying to? Edom and what's the relationship between Edom and Judah or brothers. yeah brothers right so Jacob and Esau were the uh, uh, fathers of these nations and ultimately there continues to be uh, animosity between these nations and Obadiah is, is pronouncing judgment on Edom because of their pride and their violence so as we think about Jonah uh, our brother Hugh has agreed to uh, comment on a few aspects of, of Jonah that really make it stand out from the other books we've been studying. Uh, Hugh, what did you come up with? In the, uh, the minor prophets we have seen so far, they are a spokesman for God, but they are also in alignment with God. They seem to be uh, fully involved in that which the Lord has said through them. We don't find that with Jonah. Right. We find uh, one that is more self-centered, one that uh, is not portrayed in a couple of situations as positive. Yeah. Though some of the scholars talk about it as a, uh, a legend or a myth or an analogy or something along those lines. Uh, our Lord referred to it as an event. Yeah, he did. Uh, and I, I don't know how much to get into this, but it, it's a great uh, type to the anti-type of the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. And it helps intermediately to remind the people uh, of the promises to Abraham that all nations would be blessed. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time to put those thoughts together, Hugh. I think that that's really good to think about those aspects of this book that make it stand out. And, you know, one of the things that certainly is not easily overlooked is the fact that Jonah is presented as a narrative about the prophet's life more than it is about the things he said or the communication God issued through him. Now, certainly we see a verse in which uh, Jonah is going about and saying, hey, 40 days, 
None of it's going to be destroyed. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Whereas the other uh, minor prophets, as we've been reading, and this, you know, this include the major prophets as well from this aspect, are really, there's a lot of, of those con- the content of those books. It's focused on what they had to say, the things they wrote, the things they delivered. But Jonah's not that way. Jonah's a narrative about uh, or a record of this man's life. Uh, Hugh was pointing out this is, Jonah's a historical figure. We're going to see Jesus uh, pointed to Jonah as a real person and these events as real events in his life. Uh, Hugh did an excellent job of pointing out the fact that uh, unlike the other prophets, um, Jonah was resistant to the direction God gave him to go and proclaim his word. And, and, and one of the things that really stands out to me when I think about that is, isn't it interesting that the audience that Jonah faces is more favorable, responds more favorably to the word of God than the prophet does? Yeah, I, the, the, there was a favorable response among some and all of those. Here we have an entire city that's going to repent, and here's Jonah that's frustrated and then upset because of their repentance after he had resisted God's will in the first place. So uh, several things that make this book really stand out. As we've already talked about, this is certainly one of the best-known um, stories uh, or, or books of the Bible with regard to just its content and the story of Jonah. So let me just ask this real quick. When you think of the book of Jonah, or maybe a better question is when most people think of the book of Jonah, what's the image that comes to their mind? What are, what are they thinking of first? Fish. Fish. <laughs> All right. Uh, a lot of times it's pictured as a whale, whatever sea creature we're talking about, but this, this enormous uh, fish, because Jonah spent three days in three nights in the belly, right? And it just overwhelms us to think, think about that. Um, but, you know, as we, as we study through this book, and as I know you've read this book and studied it yourself, and you reflect on, on some of the lessons, um, certainly the, it, the image of the fish never leaves your mind, does it? But what are some of the uh, real lessons or, or ideas or concepts that we should take away from a study of the book of Jonah? What is it pointing out to us? What's up? Yeah, what's what comes to your mind? Okay, yeah, uh, mix up priorities, this idea of idolatry, even nationalism can become that. Kevin, did you have a thought? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I mean, really, there's some, there's some prophetic symbolization going on. I think with the Pharisees, we see comparative judgment being used by our Lord in the New Testament, mm-hmm. um, uh, how, uh, how the nation was compared against it being more tolerable for, right? Uh, here, those in them are repentant, so I think it... it that's a, that's a good lesson. Yeah. To Ben's point, I mean, it's he, he, did, he didn't want to show mercy, kind of like the uh, prodigal son's older brother. Yeah. Right? Didn't want to show mercy. To yeah. Him. Didn't, didn't, was, was angry because of Angry because of their repentance. That's right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Trisha? I think it's short also the human romance Because while Jonah thought that people were sinful and everything else, they were so eager to repent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we may see people sinning, but if we bring the word of God to them and make them see why it's important yeah. to change, we don't know what the outcome is. That's right. Yeah. That's right. God knows the heart. We shouldn't prejudge men's heart and their motives. Good point, Stephen. Even though Jonah knew uh, in chapter 4 about the graciousness and merciful God that he you know, served, he was selfish with regard to the grace and the mercy that his own God exhibits. Yeah. I mean, that was also being exhibited himself. I mean, 
merciful to him. Yeah. He disobeyed God. Yeah. He was the earth and took yeah. it was as far as away as he thought the earth existed. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, you know, we can take lessons from that. And I find it interesting that just, what, 40 or 50 years later, God uses Assyria to take them over. That's right, yeah. You know, the northern kingdom. So. Yeah. No, great points, all of you, and thank you for bringing those up. And, you know, I heard something consistent in all the comments that were made, and that was God's mercy, God's compassion, God's love, God's concern. If there's ever a, a book in the Bible that we can turn to and immediately see evidence that God is concerned about the affairs of men and the spiritual condition of men, it would be the book of Jonah, wouldn't it? And to see how much God truly cares and the, the effort he would go to to bring about his word, to deliver his word to a rebellious, wicked nation of people and give them an opportunity to repent. Forty days later, they were going to be destroyed, Jonah said. And yet God gave them that opportunity. So if there's ever a book in the Bible that describes that for us, I think it would be Jonah. And uh, I appreciate those are some really great thoughts uh, and, uh, and, and uh, same things we need to take to heart. We're going to be talking about some of those things uh, as we go through our study tonight. We're going to kind of follow a similar format, uh, really the exact same format we've been doing every class this quarter, in that we want to take just a few moments to th think about where this book comes from. We want to take a moment or two just to uh, put it, into words the basic message of the book we've already been kind of doing that but then we really want to spend the bulk of our time thinking about well why are we studying this why is it that God preserved this little book for all of these generations all of these hundreds and hundreds of years for us to read today there's got to be a reason for that right uh, what should we take away from a study like this and and why is this book important and then as we have time we'll we'll look briefly at the kind of the overall uh, makeup of the book. So as we think about the origin of the book, um, as with all the other prophets, we see and notice that it's named for the prophet whose story it contains. And as you may have read in your workbook, Jonah, Jonah's name means dove. I have no idea if that lends significance to the story in any way. Um, but I guess when you think about a dove, what, what's the concept or the idea that we often associate with a dove? Peace, right? And and so if if I was just using that as sort of a memory trigger, maybe that's what I would use to think about Jonah's name meant peace and God desired peace with men, didn't he? He, he was giving an opportunity for man to be at peace with him. So maybe that's the connection or uh, maybe there's not an intended connection, but uh, certainly uh, something that we can re remember uh, and hang on to. Uh, as we think about the man, Jonah, then there's just a few details that we know about Jonah. He was the son of Amittai, we're told here in chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, we can turn over to 2 Kings 14. Uh, this is another thing that makes Jonah stand out a little bit. Most of the other prophets we've studied so far, there's not much information about them in other parts of the Old Testament, and often none in the New Testament either. Sometimes uh, something that one of these prophets r uh, wrote will be referenced in the New Testament. But in, in Jonah's case, we read in 2 Kings 14, 25, that we actually will read here in just a moment together, uh, that he was from the city of gath Hefer, and if we uh, turn to Joshua 19, verse 13, we'll notice that that is a town that was in the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, uh, more particularly in the tribe of Zebulun. Uh, we have already, it's already been pointed out to us by Hugh that uh, Jesus spoke of Jonah and his preaching in Matthew 12, in Matthew 16, Luke chapter 11. We'll also notice these passages here in just a moment or two. Uh, and, and when we think about Jesus speaking of Jonah and his preaching, that is an indication that Jesus accepted what is written in Jonah as being historical. Jesus is God. He was commenting about Jonah, pointing out these are things that happened. He didn't say, you remember that story of Jonah that was told for all these generations as if it was some sort of myth. He referenced Jonah as a real historical figure and these events as being real historical events. So if we believe in Jesus and his word, that's one of the things we come to accept and understand. Uh, let's talk just a moment about the timing of this writing. Uh, there's some uncertainty, certain as with uh, as with the other prophets as well, uh, but a couple of things we can point to. First of all, Jonah's carrying a message of judgment against Jonah at the point that they are a dominant power in the world, right? They're a threat uh, to Israel. It's one of the reasons that Jonah is reluctant to go there. We also know from Second Kings 14, and let's go ahead and turn over there now, and we'll just read this uh, kind of quickly together. Second Kings chapter 14. I'll begin reading in verse 23 of 2 Kings 14. 
It says, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king, became king in Samaria and reigned forty-one years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Araba, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who is from Gath Hefer. So Jonah, we don't know exactly when he lived or when he prophesied these things, but he's associated, at least here in this passage, with the reign of Jeroboam II, which is king that we've referenced in some of our previous studies, right? Jeroboam II was not a, a righteous man. He was not, uh, he was a king of the northern, of the northern kingdom there. Um, and, and it was during his time that this area that had once been occupied by Syria was restored to Israel. Jonah, we're told here, had prophesied about that happening. So one thing we can put down as a uh, point in time is well we know it was during the reign of Jeroboam that this land was restored Jonah had previously prophesied about that so he lived either during the days of Jeroboam or prior to that wouldn't that make sense so if we put a date stamp on that uh, it would seem that he he must have lived uh, and worked no later than about 760 BC as I understand it somewhere in that time frame any other thoughts or questions about that as you've done your own personal study on that it's not a terribly important aspect of it, but it is interesting to lay these, uh, these prophets on a timeline and, and try to put them uh, in the timeline of events that we're familiar with when we study through the Old Testament. For some reason I can't turn my page here. But when we think about Jonah in particular and, and his place on the timeline as it relates to the other prophets we've studied already, and again, we're going to just keep laying these prophets on the timeline where we uh, think they might best fit, uh, we see that he's... Uh, probably roughly living during the same time period as Amos and Hosea, uh, probably a little bit after the prophet Joel, uh, but it's impossible to know those things for sure. So again, any other comments about the timing, about the man Jonah, about any of these introductory type uh, aspects of the book? All right, well, let's talk about the message then. So when we think about the message of the book, we've already really kind of discussed this to, to large extent. Um, what we're seeing here in the book is that God is delivering a message. He wants a message delivered at least to the city of Nineveh, and he goes to great lengths to make sure that message gets delivered. And that message is important because he, he desires that the men of Nineveh have an opportunity, another opportunity, you might say, to be saved from their sin, to be saved from the destruction that's about to come. Uh, Ryan has volunteered to read Second Peter 3 and verse 9 for us. Ryan, if you would read that and point out what that text is telling us about God's long-suffering. So, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, the Lord is not slack con concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it, in the context there, he's saying that in, in the end times, there's going to be people that are pointing out that you know, it's been hundreds of years, generations have gone by, and God has, has not come. Like there's, therefore, there is no God. Nothing has is, nothing is happened. Look around. But the other way of looking at that is that's because of God's law that he's allowing time for people to come to repentance, to come to him. And so he's being merciful that, you know, he, he loves the, the, his creation, so he's allowing it more time. Uh, to repent, and this kind of this verse specifically, every time I read it, I think of you know Calvinism with you know the L and Tulip uh, limited atonement, where there's the belief that you know Christ's blood only was shed for some people, not all people, and if that's the case, then you know God created some people to, to not be saved, um, and this verse completely proves that is is error. So he, he wants, his, his will is that all people everywhere are saved if they do what they need to do. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's the primary point, uh, at least as it relates to our study tonight. God is long-suffering, and I've heard numerous brethren here point out over time how meaningful that term is when we think about what God endures. And he does that because he loves us. 
he is putting up with or he is suffering through many things because because he desires men to be saved. And you can just look around us and look at the news headlines, look at the things that are going on, the violence, the the terrible things that happen to even little children, uh, all of the perversion and, and, and physical suffering that happens in this world. And God allows that to continue. He suffers with that. He, it's not that he desires that, but he allows that to continue because he desires men to come to a knowledge of the truth and and the uh, the other option, obviously, is similar option to what we see in, in the book of Jonah, that there will be judgment, there will be destruction, or there will be deliverance. And deliverance comes not through the faculties of men, but it comes through the, the delivering of God's message of salvation to man, a man's willingness to accept that. So, you know, another passage that came to my mind as I was thinking about this aspect of the message of Jonah was Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11. And, and there in, in Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11, the Lord God says, I have no pleasure in the death, death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And he says, turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So there, there's a prophecy or a, a, a declaration, at least, concerning Israel. But the, the point is, God had no pleasure, never has, in the death of the wicked or in the destruction of the wicked. He desires deliverance. So why is it that we're studying this book? What's what's the reason that, that this book's been preserved, that we can study it tonight? Um, we've been pointing out similar aspects of these, these prophets uh, all along. Uh, first of all, we've already pointed out the effect of sin in, in the lives of men, and in particular in their relationship with God. Uh, Jonah certainly is no different in that he emphasizes the effect that sin has in, in man's relationship with God in a couple of different ways. We'll notice that in a moment. Uh, Jonah also strengthens our faith in God and, and gives us reasons to understand certain things or to reinforce our understanding maybe of certain aspects of God's character that builds up our faith in him. Uh, Jonah points to Jesus as Messiah and also Jonah uh, provides a basis for a better understanding of certain things we read in the New Testament. Uh, when we think about this this aspect of Jonah emphasizing the effect of sin in man's relationship with God, uh, it's, it's uh, hard to overlook uh, how upset God was because of the sins going on in Nineveh. Uh, Dorothy has volunteered to read uh, Jonah chapter 1 verse 2 and Jonah chapter 3 verse 4. And Dorothy, if you would do that and, and maybe just offer a comment on uh, what effects that you notice there that the sins of Nineveh had on their relationship with God. One, two. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So God noticed their wickedness. And then chapter 3, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, when he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So God recognized their wickedness, and it was so great he wanted to destroy them, but... Even though he couldn't tolerate their sin sinfulness, um, because he was merciful, he sent to Jonah to teach them so they'd have an opportunity to repent. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's exactly right. What we see clearly pointed out to us from the very beginning of this book is that what, Nineveh, what was going on in Nineveh, God characterizes wickedness. Okay, it wasn't just... Uh, silliness. It wasn't just something that wasn't that big of a deal. It was wickedness, and it was wickedness that was going to cause them to be destroyed. Forty days later, they were going to be wiped out. And and so God sends Jonah then to uh, preach this message of judgment against the city and, in hopes that they would repent. Fortunately, we're going to see that they did, uh, as we've been talking about already. So that's one way that, that Jonah emphasizes the effect of sin on man's relationship with God and pointing to the Ninevites and how their wickedness was causing them to be separated from God and was about to result in their destruction. But, you know, Jonah also uh, points this out himself, doesn't he? And, and it, as we read through the first chapter of Jonah, we won't take time to read this whole chapter, but in verses 1 and 2, uh, uh, or excuse me, in chapter 1, verse 2, as, as Dorothy was just reading, uh, God instructs Jonah to go to Nineveh, but then verse 3 tells us he went somewhere else. Where did he go? He was going to Tarshish, and notice the word there. Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
there's ever a picture that we should have burned into our mind of what we're doing when we choose the path of sin, we're fleeing away from God, right? We may not think of it in that way at the moment, but that's really what we're doing. We're choosing a path that's a departure from God's word. And sometimes it's, you know, the devil's very deceptive and he may make it look like it's a pleasant path. He may make it look like, well, it's really not wandering very far from what God said you should do. It's not that big a deal. But the truth is, Jonah was fleeing away from the presence of the Lord. He was not, he recognized that in obedience to God, he would be put in a very uncomfortable position. And he didn't want to be in that position. He didn't want to do that. So he is, his initial solution to that problem, he thought, would I'm going to get as far away from this as I can. I'm going to flee away from God. So that's just an image that's hard to get out of your mind as you read through this. And it's pointed out again in verse 10 when Jonah's on the ship. So he fled, to, uh, he was on his way trying to go to Tarshish. He boards this ship and he's on this ship with these idolatrous men and he's asleep somehow in the bottom of this ship when this great storm uh, comes upon the, the ocean or upon the sea that was sent by God. And it tells us that as he was fleeing the presence of the Lord, that the men, it tells us, were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. It says there in verse 10. He, he, told, he admitted it. I'm fleeing from God. I'm trying to depart from God. And, and so in that condition, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he, he tells these men what, need, he, what needs to happen. Um, and and in uh, at the end of chapter one in chapter two verses three and four as he's praying this prayer to god notice what he says he says for you speaking to god jonah says for you cast me into the deep into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me all your billows and your waves passed over me then i said i've been cast out of your sight yet i will look again toward your holy temple we're going to notice another aspect of this in a moment as it deals with god's knowledge of things god's ability to see things but Jonah, from Jonah's perspective, he was cast out of the sight of God. There, again, another image you might have in your mind as it relates to our, the effect of sin in, in our lives and our relationship with God, being cast out of the sight of God. Not that literally God can't see us anymore, but that that separation exists when we choose a path that's different from what God would, would have us to do. Ben, did you have a comment? Yeah, it's just interesting. It's just a side note of chapter 1. When you think about inspiration, that these men still have free will. Yeah. You know, that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. He was still able to sin. He was still able to flee from the presence of the Lord. And that's very similar to Peter in Galatians chapter 2, an apostle with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and yet he still was involved with uh, hypocrisy. So there's something that stood out with inspiration. It did not turn him into robots. Yeah. He still made this decision on his own to disobey God. Yeah. Yeah, God gave him that ability to make that choice, that's for sure. That is for sure. And so let's think about uh, how Jonah then emphasizes our, uh, the, the basis for our faith in God. And um, there's a few things I noticed, and there's probably others that you've noticed as well. Uh, one of the aspects of, of, of God that is really emphasized here in the book of Jonah is the fact that uh, God knows what's going on in this world. And he certainly knew what was going on in Nineveh, chapter 1, verse 2. Um, he knew what was going on in Jonah's life, in every part of it. When Jonah was fleeing to Tarshish, God could see that. God knew that. When Jonah was drowning in the sea after the men cast him overboard, even though Jonah felt like he was hidden from God, that he was cast out of God's sight, God could see. God knew. And God would provide this fish that would deliver him from, from drowning. Um, God heard, it tells us in chapter 2, verses 7 through 10, if you want to just read that with me for a moment. In chapter 7, Jonah's still in the midst of this prayer to God while he's inside the fish. And he says, my soul fainted within me, I, or excuse me, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless, worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now notice verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Jonah's in the belly of a fish, way down deep in the sea, and guess who can hear his prayer? It was God. 
God could hear, God knew, God, Jonah's still able to communicate. So as we think about our, the basis for our faith in God, the, his ability to know our needs, his ability to respond to our cries, Jonah illustrates that for us very well. God could hear the cries of Jonah. God cared about that. Um, and then another aspect or another thing that points to God's ability to know things, uh, I believe, is in chapter 4, verse 11. In chapter 4 and verse 11, this is after the Ninevites have repented. Uh, Jonah has already kind of thrown his, his temper tantrum about the whole thing, and God has taught him a lesson. And here at the end uh, of, the, of the book, God is speaking, and he said, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? God knew the number of people in the city, I, I know he knew every soul in that city, and he understood something about those people. He understood, he's, he described it as they cannot discern between their right hand and their left. He knew what they needed, and he gave them what they needed to give them the ability to make the decision, to discern between that which is right and that which is wrong. And so uh, God knew these things, and God was able to provide those things. Another another aspect that we've pointed out already is that God cares. So not only does he know, not only does he hear, but God cares. It's hard to overlook as we read through the book of Jonah. And he cares not just about a particular race of people. He cared about Jonah. He kept Jonah from drowning. He directed Jonah and where to go and what to do. And he gave Jonah the words to say when he went into Nineveh. But he cared about the Ninevites, who were the enemies of Jonah uh, of Jonah's people. He cared about their deliverance, and we've seen through the other prophets that he cares about all men. He's given men much grace, much time to turn from their evil ways. Uh, you know, he also cared about those idolatrous sailors. <laughs> um, he responded to their cries there at the end of chapter 1. When they cried out to the Lord in verse 14 and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. God didn't have to stop that storm. But he did. He allowed those men continued opportunities as well. And certainly they were impressed with what had happened to the extent that they feared the Lord exceedingly. It tells us in verse 16, and offered sacrifice to the Lord and they took vows. So God cares about all men. Uh, and, and even when Jonah ran away, God was seeking to motivate him to return. And that's a lot about what we see with his uh, being consumed by this fish and then, then spit back out. So one other aspect that, that I think is very important to bring out, I know we're running short on time, so we're going to go through this a little bit quickly, but uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about this one point. God's word, when it's delivered, it has the power to convict, regardless of the attitude of the one who delivers it. Jonah was not a man who cared about those that he was preaching to. He didn't want them to respond favorably. But it was God's word that had the power to convict. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, if you'd turn over there with me for just a moment. Romans chapter 10 and in verse uh, 14, Paul writes here and he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, God could have chosen to deliver his word to man in a variety of different ways. Hebrews, uh, the Hebrew writer tells us that God at various times and various ways spoke to man in the past, but in these last days has spoken to us through his son. God has chosen throughout time to present his will to man. And it was that word that God delivered to man that had the power to convict men of their sin. The Ninevites were convicted by the word of God, even though Jonah really didn't want them to repent. When we begin preaching and teaching the word of God, that's exactly what God calls us to do. It isn't to talk about God's word. It's to proclaim the word of God. That is the instrument. This is the instrument. This is the sword of the spirit. This is the thing that has the power to convict. We should not ever lose sight of that. We should expect those who preach and teach. You should expect me. You should expect Ben. You should expect anyone who's standing before you to present God's word in his purity and not to pollute it with their own thoughts, ideas, and opinions that may or may not align with God's word in the first place. But even if they do, those aren't the things that really have the power to convict. It's the word of God. And so it's our responsibility to honor God by proclaiming that word. Jonah, when he proclaimed God's word, even though his, his attitude was not right, 
um, it had that same power to convict. So then Jonah also points to Jesus as Messiah, and and we can turn to Matthew chapter 12. Now, I hope you studied some of this on your own. There's a, uh, there are several aspects of this we could spend quite a bit of time on. We simply won't have time tonight. I'll just kind of quickly read Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. Matthew chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. This is where Jesus here is speaking, speaking to those Pharisees that were challenging him. They said, we want to see a sign from you. And he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. And so Jonah, this this story of Jonah, Jesus refers back to it and he, he uses this as a metaphor for what's happening to him. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth. Okay, so this is pointing to Christ as Messiah is pointing to the time that Jesus would spend. But also Jesus points out that the repentance of the men of Nineveh, as I think Ben was pointing out earlier, their repentance was really a point of judgment upon the people of God, the, the Israelites, the Jewish people, who were not willing to repent. These religious leaders who uh, sought to be regarded as holy and righteous and all of these things, And yet their hearts were not right with God. And so these people, these Ninevites that would be regarded so evil by the Jews uh, in days gone by, they would judge the Jews. They would judge those who remained in their sin. And so uh, certainly Jonah reinforces Jesus as Messiah. I apologize, we're running out of time. We've only got about four four minutes left. So I'm going to kind of quickly go through a couple of last points. And then if we have a couple of uh, moments here at the end, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to, to speak up. Certainly when we think about the way that Jonah deepens our understanding of the New Testament, I'll just simply say, what would we make of the passage we just read if we didn't have the book of Jonah preserved for us? If Jesus was referring back to that, story of Jonah. If we didn't have that preserved for us. What would we be thinking tonight? Would that make sense? Would we have a lot of questions? Absolutely we would. We would be wondering about that. And yet God preserved this for us in such a way that it deepens our understanding of things that Jesus had to say. It deepened our, it, it allowed the people that were standing in front of Jesus, those Pharisees, to look back and think about that story that they'd read and heard their entire life and compare themselves to the Ninevites <laughs> that Jesus said was going to stand in judgment over them. And there's perhaps a, a number of other things that you could think of as it relates to, to that point. We just don't have time to go into. So when we think about the overall structure of the book, there's a, a good outline of this book in your workbook, so I won't take any time for that. You can kind of see the layout of it, of it on the screen. And, uh, and, and, and as we think through what we're studying and considering tonight, uh, we've talked about all of these aspects, where the book came from and its timing of it, the basic message of the book, uh, why it is that we've studied. One last thing I just wanted to bring up and get your quick thoughts on this. Uh, we, we mentioned at the beginning of class or towards the beginning of class how many times when we think of the book of Jonah, the first thought that comes to our mind and the minds of most people is the big fish. And there's been a lot of controversy. Some, some of you even mentioned how different scholars have offered different ideas about, well, that couldn't be real. There's not a real fish out there in the ocean with a stomach big enough or a esophagus big enough to swallow Jonah or whatever it is, you know. Did you notice as you're reading through the book of Jonah that God didn't just prepare a great fish? What else did God prepare that is different, that is not an everyday thing that we would see in our lives? Can you think of anything else that we read about in the book of Jonah that God prepared especially for Jonah? What was that? A plant that grew up. It wasn't just like it sprouted overnight. It grew up as big enough to provide shade for him. And then he prepared a worm that destroyed that plant. That was not an ordinary thing that God did, but he did it. And then he prepared a vehement east wind, it tells us, that reminded Jonah or caused him great, great, great uh, affliction there in chapter 4. He also, in chapter 1, he, he, he prepared a great 
wind, a tempestuous wind on the sea. Didn't he? Was that an everyday thing? Was it an everyday thing for there to be a great huge storm, so much is going to break the ship up, and then all of a sudden a calm when they threw somebody overboard? And the point is that the God who can do all of those things certainly could prepare a fish to swallow Jonah. What kind of fish, what kind of creature was that? I don't know, and it really doesn't matter. The point is that while that is the image that stands out in our mind, the, the, the real lesson is that God sought man's repentance and he went to great extraordinary extents by preparing these things so his word might be delivered and we have an opportunity as children of God to deliver that message to those around us every day what an important task that is if God would think so importantly of it in the days of Jonah and he would task the disciples of Christ with that he certainly expects that of us today. So we have that opportunity, and I encourage us to be thinking about that as we leave tonight. Thank you so much for your participation. Our class is over tonight. I certainly look forward to studying again with you next week. We'll be studying uh, the book of Micah. Um, As you read through that book, I didn't even put that slide up, but be looking for uh, some things concerning the latter days and some things concerning the ruler in Israel there in in the book of Micah. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.